Okay, so today we are going to be talking about Christopher Columbus, uh, myth versus reality, and Spain, and uh, how the Spanish expanded into the New World. Uh, so what we want to look at first is uh, Europe and what was going on specifically. Um, for this part, we're going to be looking mostly at how it is connected to Spain. Uh, because, of course, there were other parts where Europe was being impacted with um, the French and the English. But we'll, we'll get to that. So um, a couple of the issues um, that were taking place as far as what gets us to Christopher Columbus was the fact that um, the uh, major religion at the time um, in Europe was Christianity, um, but that you had expanding Muslim territory. So, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, if you look at religion in Europe and Spain, if we look at specifically the Spanish, there's, uh, Catholicism and what they felt was the pressure of expanding um, Islamic states uh, and and Muslim religion and Muslims the Islamic religion and, and, and Muslims and the expansion of those countries, the Ottoman Empire, specifically, this was connected to at the time, the Ottoman Empire um, did control quite a large area of territory. And specifically within the Ottoman Empire was, of course, that they held some of the most prized trade routes. Um, and the specifically with the spice routes, and they had complete control over this and took advantage of that, uh, of course, because while the trade routes were open to Europeans, um, if you were not Muslim, they did charge more. So this is going to propel, the purpose of this in is that there was a, a significant desire to find new trade routes east. in hopes that they could circumvent essentially the Ottoman Empire and not have to pay those taxes. One of the other things that is um, going to be taking place around this time is the printed word. And, and what's important with this is that the printed word helped propel this desire, um, not only for new trade routes, but also adventure and travel. So you did have trade routes but we'll do it. adventure and travel. And more importantly with the printed word is that people could read about this, um, uh, about these adventures. And there was a desire to know more. And the fact that uh, more people became literate, more people were literate because you had more access to books and news. So much like later the telegraph and then the telephone and the texts, if you will, on the internet, these things help propel uh, a significant, oops, that's not what I meant to do that. Did I get a significant, um, so we can get back, sorry. A significant uh, desire to um, not only hear the news, but know about the news really quickly. Let's put this back up here. There we go. And, and so this then propelled the interest in, in uh, travel and adventure. One of the best known for this was Marco Polo. And hearing about um, his adventures uh, and what they could also bring that which specifically these adventures and being printed brought prestige to the country they represented. Okay. 
now what's going on with Spain also at this time was uh, had, had to do with uh, what was called the Reconquista. You had a uh, Queen Isabella and uh, um, Prince Ferdinand. And what they ended up doing is that they, uh, in their marriage, united what was Aragon and Castile, which made Spain. In part of this after their marriage was to immediately set on a, a reconquista, reconquering, to take uh, Granada which was the last Muslim principality in the area, obviously not everywhere, in Iberia. And to do this, um, it, well, what it did is it ultimately, by doing this, it set them up to be more prepared to, to traverse the seas uh, in the Atlantic for new prospects than uh, the French or the English at this particular time. I mean, in fact, Spain was first in the ability to do this. What they, what this setup was really two groups of people. Um, and well, that the really combined together was that you had clergy and soldiers, um, that, that kind of formed into a single crusading element that were called the conquistadors. The conquistadores were this mix. They were both, they were a military clergy and soldier that went hand in hand. And together, um, uh, the goal was both, right, spiritual and physical in conquering territories. We're going to conquer territories for the glory of Spain and for the glory of God. Um, so the glory of Spain and God. So you already had this set in group that could be used. They already had this militaristic force ready to go and a desire to find new um, trade routes. Now, uh, this D here, there was some, um, I don't want to say exploration, but travels to certain areas already, um, but the the thing was with most um we'll say sea travel is that it was uh the the key component is that it was for investors so of course money was the key factor essentially that they would see a return on their investment so uh and local individual investors were hesitant to invest in things that weren't a sure bet, if you will, or very close to it, um, because it was expensive, extremely expensive. Uh, and there was a lot of things that you had to do. Of course, the general, um, we'll call it, um, for the ships, the, the supplies, right? Ships, men, food, whatnot. But then you also had to have a royal charter um, or license, uh, in this case, in order to do so, because a percentage always went back to the crown. So they weren't going to just invest in long shots because that could be a ton of money that you lost if it wasn't a sure bet. So practical men were not really, um, they weren't interested in um, exploration just for the adventure of it. There had to be uh, generally secure money uh, involved. So one of the areas that this had they'd done quite a bit of was following the coast of Africa. It was known the Portuguese were first. 
in this and it already set up a precedent for areas. Um, and there was lots of stuff that the coast of Africa provided. You had fishing, gold, um, ivory, and of course slaves. And so this kind of was, uh, oh, one of the ones was pepper too. The, the, the thing, well, these were the kind of the, the main commodities of within Africa. So one of the things that the Portuguese had, had started and others had followed with that was to do um, quick raids off the coast. Right, because going inland was much more expensive and potential dangers and having to fight more individuals. So you essentially, you know, got off your ship, did a, a, a very fast grab of goods, uh, which often, like I said, one of the big things is still going to be slaves with this. And then hop back in your ships and get out of there before you have a large scale uh, attack. And then you don't have to worry about that. <clears throat> they did this for a while until, of course, um, <clears throat> various African rulers, because of not wanting to be attacked and, and being aware of this, uh, and, and how Africa was set up at this point was that you had uh, various kings and chieftains that there was no, it was not a Africa <clears throat> in its entirety, rather that they were all for their own. They had their own internal warfares and other issues going on, um, that they would make deals in order to be not raided. So they would go inland to enemy territory for them. And, and bring back goods. Including, of course, people. And what they would do is they would trade this, these items and people for goods um, from the Europeans. Um, the Canary Islands, as I get this back, sorry, it always seems to like to go away once you pause it. The Canary Islands were kind of the waypoint for this. Um, that was a stopping point towards the African coast. And also for refueling. and is actually going to be um, essentially the uh, plantation um, with slave labor example. Here what they did is they um, initially, which, which is the same in most places, is enslaved the locals um, but as it became a central point for further conquest and colonization, uh, as well as as locals uh, died off, they brought in African slaves into the Canary Islands to uh, work the land, specifically with uh, sugar plantation was one of the main commodities. And this, uh, the idea of a cash crop, and this ends up being used actually not with Spain so much as this is going to be the model for the English. Nonetheless, the Canary Islands is an important part, especially because, as it says, a stopping point uh, for the African coast to um, rest and refuel because the reality is, is that the ships uh, were not large enough uh, to travel nonstop, if you will. Right, you hug the coast, you go, Open sea, essentially what this is, open sea is dangerous and the technology was uncertain for success, right? And the key with that goes back to this point here, goes back to the idea that 
it was with investors this travel and they wanted the money so they weren't they that you needed to have that aspect for going um, and it, it provided a central place it becomes important if you're looking at it because of not only this massive trade uh, for what, what is going to become important for right slave trade and plantation plantation setup both of these things um, which are going to be continued in um, with the English especially for quite a long while it also helped with general you know practicing of seafaring now what this gets us to is Columbus and Christopher Columbus was, um, you know, it, there's there's a lot of myth versus reality. On Christopher Columbus, right? And Christopher Columbus was not Spanish, um, but he's going to be financed by Spain. He had a hard time getting that financing. And what happens is that Spain is just ripe for being it, deciding to make this gamble on him in hopes that it pays off to get the trade. Now, some of the myth with Columbus, of course, was that, um, and you know, they taught this for quite a while. Um, I, I know um, that there's still uh, times where um, I hear that people learn this, although less and less now, which is at least good. Um, but there's a variety of myths that uh, is taught often about Columbus. All right, we're going to watch this short video. Um, this is uh, from the 60s. Uh, uh, why we celebrate Christopher Columbus Day is what this video was for. That's kind of a sing-along thing. So hopefully you can hear it. If not, you can go to YouTube and just type in Mellow Tunes, Christopher Columbus, and you can watch it there too. So I'm going to play this. <laughs> hundred years ago, there were people on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, but neither knew about the other. On the western side, our side, the people had reddish-brown skins and lived in huts or wigwams. On the eastern side, in Europe, the people were white-skinned. They had learned how to build houses and large sailing ships, but they still didn't know much about the rest of the world. In fact, most of them believed the earth was flat. Then one day, a map maker named Christopher Columbus had an idea. Do you know what? I think the world isn't flat at all. I think it's round like a ball. Did you hear what he said? Did you hear what he said? He said that the world is round. Oh, he's crazy. He's man. He's I think the world isn't flat at all. I think it's round like a ball. Like a ball. The world was flat in the brim of your hat, and that is very plain. I know that I'm right, oh, I know that I'm right when I say that the world is round. Oh, I'm right, no, no, I'm right. My thinking is sound, and I'll prove the world's round. It won't take very long. But it did take long, seven long years, before Columbus could convince a king or a queen to let him try out his idea. Then Queen Isabella of Spain agreed to supply the ships and men for his trip. I will discover a shortcut to India and bring back some of the great wealth I find there. And I can do it, for I know the world is round. And instead of going east to India, I shall sail west and reach India around the other way. It will be a shorter and cheaper way, for I'll do it all by sea. Queen Isabella provided Columbus with three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. And on August 3rd, 1492, they set sail across the unknown Atlantic. High on the foaming tide Over the ocean Onward our ships will ride Onward my sailors The 
ship sailed onward. But two long months after they started, there was still no sign of land ahead. Turn back, Columbus! Turn back, Columbus! We'll not turn back until we find India. Onward, men! By October 10th, the sailors and the crew were ready to take matters into their own hands. If Columbus won't do as we ask, we'll put him in chains. And we'll turn the ships around ourselves. Wait, have you heard? One of our men has just seen a branch in the ocean. What of it? It had fresh berries on it. That means we're near land. Hooray! Two days later, the ships reached land, and Columbus and his crew saw the people with reddish-brown skins who lived there. Oh, I think it is rather surprising that they should have reddish brown skins. But now since we have landed in India, then these people must be Indians. We'll call this part of India San Salvador. And I take possession of it in the name of the King and Queen of Spain. The people Columbus called Indians were very friendly. And they gave Columbus and his men many gifts but not the rich jewels and gold for which they had come. For Columbus really wasn't in India at all. He was on one of the islands off the coast of America. But because of Columbus's mistake, the natives of America have been called Indians ever since. Columbus visited other islands near San Salvador, looking for the great wealth of India. And then he and some of his men returned to Spain. Columbus had no trouble getting ships and men for his second voyage, but he still hadn't the slightest idea that he was headed for the vast continent of America, and that he would have had to cross it and sail over the Pacific Ocean before he could reach India by traveling west. The men of Europe were no longer afraid of the ocean. Columbus made two more voyages, and other explorers followed. But each year on October 12th, we celebrate Columbus Day. The anniversary of that day in 1492, when Columbus first sighted the land of the new world, America. Okay, so let me get out of this here. I'll go back there. So that video, what I like about it is it has like all of the incorrect assumptions about Columbus and the myths that were there. One of them, of course, was that he, uh, people believed that the um, that the world was flat, and Columbus thought it was round. And um, that, you know, that essentially that it was a long trip and they were ready to um, uh, mutiny. And the only consequence was the name Indians for the locals, for the native population, um, that um, he discovered America. Right, these are all, these are all incorrect um, narrative about Columbus and and like I said this is what I was actually taught in um, I don't know you know when exactly whether it's elementary school middle school or high school but that this myth and this narrative kind of uh, certainly continued and and it was only later discovering that that none of that was actually correct um, so this part of the myth and if we're looking at the reality of it next i mean and so you know why does this happen well 
Certainly he was propped up after the Revolutionary War because um, the newly formed United States wanted these kind of narratives that created this idea of, of you know, uh, exploration and determination against all odds. But the reality is, is that um, people already knew the world was round. They'd known, uh, for sure we know, uh, uh, the Greeks have records of that. I mean, so this, this didn't get lost somewhere along the way. This was already known. The, the reason that um, he was rejected for so long was, of course, one, because of the expense and the uncertainty of um, open sea travel. He did, um, it was for looking for India, uh, for new routes, for trade. That was, that was true, that was his goal. And, and he did think he had discovered India and uh, even when people were telling him, no, you didn't, <laughs> uh, he went to the grave believing so. Um, but what his, his thing was, is that he miscalculated their circumference of the world, uh, the distance that it would take, um, then the circumference, the world. And, and, and so everyone else is also saying, because again, the expense and uncertainty, you know, we don't think your calculations are right. We're not going to fund that. Um, and what happened is that the, uh, Spain was willing to gamble because of the Reconquista, they had the resources and a desire for trade routes made it, it worth it, that they could circumvent, uh, the Ottoman empire. So what they did do is, and he did 1492, he did, he had three ships and 90 men, which were mostly criminals that were um, given, uh, that were the only ones willing to go essentially because it, many people thought, I mean, it was a, it was a death sentence. You're going to do this. The boat doesn't have the resources. Uh, or the ability to hold all this you're gonna and they made a stop on the Canary Islands um, it, so that it actually was only 33 days of sailing total uh, of open sea sailing um, so we can put that right there. they stopped at the Canary Islands and so it was only 33 days of travel and it was supposedly pretty calm travel with that but but again even with this it still would believe that they would run out of supplies not for the 33 days but uh was it believed um be if 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 it truly if they really were going to go to india right in the end it was only 33 days of travel and they didn't end up obviously in india um, but rather, um, landed in, um, uh, various islands, including what was now Haiti and the Dominican Republic and Cuba. So landed on several islands. He did go to several islands. What is now, let's say, let's make sure Haiti, Dominican Republic and Cuba, and he ended up uh, giving it the, the term Hispaniola for one of them, San Salvador, um, uh, but discovered he landed on the Bahamas too. And, and then the other islands. So, uh, the Bahamas, uh, Hispaniola. Uh, is what that he named for what was Haiti, Dominican Republic, and Cuba today. That's that was that was part of it was named, and then of course, the natives as Indians certainly uh, lasted. Uh, what he he wrote back uh, to the King Queen of of Spain saying, um, well, because the main search, what was the purpose, was of course 
trade routes. But it was also for gold. And I mean, this is going to be a key focus. And so what he did is he wrote back to the king queen and said um, that the, they do not have arms and they are all naked and have no skill in arms. And so very cowardly that a thousand would not stand against three armed Spaniards. And so they are fit to be ordered about and made to work, plant and do everything else that may be needed and build towns and be taught our customs and go about clothed. So, of course, uh, I mean, for Columbus, it was also about slave, uh, slave labor. For the Spain, they saw it also about converting uh, new Christians. Right, uh, that was seen as their equal part duty of being able to have an economic purpose, but also a religious purpose in the process. So he sent this back um, and actually set off to, to colonize. Um, one of the ships ran aground and the rest stayed on the island. They built forts from the wrecked crews. And after sending the various notes and letters, he went back to Spain. So here we go, let's see. One ship was uh, was ran aground and used it to build forts. You had uh, 39 of crew remained on the island. And Christopher Columbus, Christopher went back to Spain and of course he brought um, brought the small amount of gold jewelry found on some of the natives the reality was there wasn't a lot and so they're gonna be digging and trying to to find gold that really wasn't available also brought back people to show they could work and and other plants and and whatnot and this was of course to show that look you can do this and he, he wanted to he he overemphasized these things as well of course um this sets off a domino effect this is 11 of exploration now that they know that they can make it and investors Spain gives him uh, new sh some new ships. Men are willing to sign up for the crew now because they, they you know, again, money. They don't have to have criminals. Um, and then he was also made admiral and governor of the new islands. And so he goes back to um, the islands after, you know, with much fanfare and seen as, as this big hero, yeah, you know, successful, you've done all these great things. Um, but when he gets back, he discovers that the men had left behind um, to continue the colony that they had been killed. So uh, crew was killed by the natives um, mostly because it they of the harsh treatment but of course what he does with this is that he's able to use this as justification for an um well for war right enslavement as he called it because the reality was is they didn't um, the, Spain didn't want to do it that way they were more concerned they wanted it to be you know that we're going to convert them and whatnot but if you had uh, uh, what was seen as appropriate justification for doing so then you could what he did is enslave them and then incredibly harsh treatment two one three There was, uh, I mean, all, all of that as far as they had to pay 
tribute in gold and work the mines. You had a quota. If you could not fulfill it, you didn't get food. Or you could be beaten. Uh, body, like a, a hand or foot cut off. They raped the women. Oops. And it was incredibly brutal treatment. So much so that it got back to the king and queen of Spain who were uncomfortable with this. Um, and um, weren't, were not okay with the continued violence. There's also some um, rumors. So Christopher Columbus was, Columbus was extremely violent. And there was some belief that his mental capabilities were diminishing. He still believed that he discovered India. Well, not, you know, a new route. Um, and eventually what they did just to get him out of the way, because he was kind of cramping their style with everything, was that they gave him another ship and said explore <laughs> just get out of our way and this was to remove him from the area so i mean he had a, a crazy kind of decline but what it i mean so the the legacy of columbus right was of course um brutality and enslavement it also opened the door for uh, exploration to uh, the Americas and it's going to kick start off this uh, competition of colonization between Spain, France, and England. There's gonna be others that do, but these are the main three, and they all had different styles of colonization. Okay, so um, that's, that's you know, the myth and then the reality of Columbus, which is extremely brutal, which is why a lot of places don't celebrate Columbus Day anymore, finally. Um, certainly recognizing the reality of that. I mean, so, you know, so the what was deemed important and what, about what he did really wasn't. Um, certainly what was important was that it kick-started off this, this competition between these groups and did lead to the colonization um, and eventually the establishment of the United States. Um, because of his actions, even if they were completely out there for the reasons and what he um, thought, you know, that he was doing. So we are looking at this word colonization. I think one of the key things you want to see with that is, is what does colonization mean for Europe, Europeans? Because there's different types of, of structures of colonization and whatnot. For colonization, it didn't wasn't just about moving in and establishing rule. That's part of it. So you moved there and established rule. Now again, France is gonna be slightly different than this. They're all gonna to take this slightly different. Um, especially but for Spain. Um, but but even the, the English as well. You moved in and established rule, um, but that's not all of it, it's much more encompassing. What it also meant was essentially bringing everything <clears throat> that was uh, European culture, 
right? Your language, religion, animals, food, clothing, etc. I mean, anything. And then the goal with all of this was to transform the environment and make it a, a replica as much as possible to their um, country or home, right? Your goal is to turn it to whites, New Spain, uh, New England, you know, New France. The idea was this is a new little France, a new little England, a new little Spain. And you were trying to completely transform it. That means you have your cattle, the animals. Um, the problem with this, right? Not just for the, for people, but for the environment, for environment. is when you bring new plants and animals, you're introducing new um, species, um, um, plants and seeds, things that didn't have um, a natural predator species. Um, to the environment. So what happens is that they can take over the environment where in Europe they may have had natural predators. Natural predator, not for everything, right? But it can take over the environment and it does. It kills off um, various things. It completely transforms it. It can also bring disease. And this not only was disease from plants and animals, but so disease from animals, disease from people. And you're putting it into an environment that had no uh, immunities to these things. This was not the intent, of course, of any of the people that came over. Um, certainly they'll use it later to their advantage. But what you have in, is with the um, discovery and then the mass uh, expansion and colonization, um, first of Spain and then others, was that you had massive uh, disease that just swept through and decimated uh, an area that didn't have immunities to these. And why was it so uh, virulent? Well, you, really you had um, three kind of areas that brought it in in Europe, right? What you have is urban centers and urban centers if, you know, dense population, which is going to allow for a lot of uh, various antibodies and diseases that, that, you know, that if you live there, you grow up with and you're used to. Travel, right? It was the hub for that which brings in more diseases again but in in Europe they were not they were immune to a lot of these I had grown antibodies and then domestic animals all of these ends up in this trifecta that essentially just wipes out um, the native population in Hispaniola they estimate um, about in 1492 300,000 uh, population, right? And then it had declined in around the 1500s to about 30,000. And by 1548, um, almost all were dead. And this is because of this. And this mass disease, um, I mean, this massive wave of, of disease certainly is what helped Spain as well as others 
colonize and take over. Again, didn't start off intentional. They certainly are going to use various things to their benefit to help with this. Um, but it was devastating. And so you have both this um, ecological change as well as change with the local populations just being wiped out. All right, we're going to end there with that one. And then um, the next one we're going to talk about is, is uh, New Spain and how um, the Spanish after Columbus sent conquistadors and conquered areas, Cortez and whatnot, and then how that transformed as they continued.